Hi, I'm Phil, welcome to my channel, and today is probably a few days away from the publication of this book. Well, yeah, this this is just a postcard that I got free in Doctor Who magazine, but I mean, the actual book is bigger, it, that, that, that sort of size. Uh, but, but yeah, this is the cover. It's written by Crystal D and Simon Guerrier, and uh, yeah, it's all about the women of Doctor Who. Simon Guerrier has written Doctor Who fiction across many mediums. He has written Doctor Who novels, Doctor Who short stories, Doctor Who comic strips, Doctor Who. He's written many, many big Finnish audio dramas. He's also written non-fiction about Doctor Who, quite a lot of non-fiction books about Doctor Who too. But his work doesn't just stop with Doctor Who, he's also written tie-in novels for Primeval and Being Human, he's a documentary producer, he has written some very funny short films which he has produced with his brother. He is a man with many bows to his writing string. Crystal D you may know as the presenter of the Doctor Who fan show on the official Doctor Who YouTube channel, or maybe from her contributions to Doctor Who magazine, or maybe from her time with the five Who fans, or maybe even further back to her own YouTube channel where she used to interview cosplayers at conventions. These two have combined their forces to come up with this book, and recently I had the pleasure of sitting down and chatting with them about it. Simon, Crystal, thank you for coming along and um, and doing this interview for me. Uh, we're going to be talking about your brand new book, Doctor Who, The Women Who Lived, uh, which is out very soon, and you guys, that's you watching this video, can win it if you want to. you just got to stick around to the end of the video to find out how. I know, it's cheeky, isn't it, really? But there we go. <laughs> got to make him stick around somehow. It's like a tease. I know. Who titles tease? <laughs> so, so this is the book you guys have written together. Uh, how, did it, how would you describe it to someone who had never heard of it before? It's the greatest book ever. Well, obviously. Yes. <laughs> I would say it's... Bedtime stories about the inspiring and amazing women in Doctor Who. Yeah, yeah. I think that's good. It's, it's a celebration of the uh, many amazing, or many of the amazing women in Doctor Who. It's, it's not a comprehensive guide to all the women in Doctor Who, because that would be a bigger book. But um, <laughs> it's our favourites, uh, ones that we thought were interesting. Yeah. Uh, all the companions, uh, we've taken a very broad view of the companions. Uh, and just people we thought were interesting, really. It's interesting you said storybook, because I, I noticed when I was flicking through the available pages on Amazon uh, that it, it has a very much feel of the books like uh, Bedtime Stories for Rebel Girls. Was that an inspiration for the book at all? Or? I think the format of this book is largely borrowed from Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls. I think when we were uh, in early discussions about this book, we thought that we might do a non-fiction book, and it would be a bit more like an encyclopedia, like a reference book. And the thinking behind changing the format into fiction was it just makes it more interesting you know you can you can look up characters you know on um on the internet and it doesn't really it's a description not a celebration and i think with this uh, there's a magical feel to it i think there's something about fairy tale that makes it more magical um and it's great for small kids you can you can read it to small kids and also any any age can enjoy this i think it's not the barrier of the barrier of entry is not too high if that makes sense it's a good introduction i think and it, and it, the, the format gives you the opportunity to put some gorgeous artwork in there as well because i mean every page much like the rebel girls books has a full page illustration to go with it uh were, were you guys involved in in picking the artists or was uh to a certain extent yes i mean i, I should say that good night stories for rebel girls isn't the only book that we looked at we, no. we did look yeah. at a range of books uh books about women and, and celebrating women ones that were devoted to lots of women ones that were devoted to particular women in history uh, we looked at a range of other books generally and doctor who books generally so there's it was a bit of a mishmash of different things mm. um but on the on the artwork yes we um we certainly suggested people not i don't know about crystal but not everybody i suggested mm. made it into the list because that, that it was decided by the editorial team and BBC Books it ultimately, although we had a lot of say in it. Crystal and I also um, stayed up very late one Sunday night writing yes. an Excel spreadsheet of briefs for all oh, the artists. Okay. I, do you know, I've never checked. I've never gone back and checked. Did they all deliver what we asked for? 
I haven't. You've just actually you've actually just reminded me that we did that. Uh, the one that forgot. I do know, yeah. the one that I do know is uh, that Liz Shaw is uh, that the the amazing illustration of Liz Shaw, uh, the companion of the Third Doctor, is exactly what I asked for, and it's mm-hmm. a mishmash of her and something else from Doctor Who, and I was very pleased to see yeah. that. Um, it just made my, my tedious fan heart um, mm. glow Yeah. with tedious pleasure. The Bill Potts one is on brief as well. Yeah, yeah, That's on right. brief. Yeah, yeah. That's on brief. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, we could so, go into that, but I don't know if it'll be a spoiler. <laughs> yeah, well, no, we should let people see, I think. I don't know. I, I um, Yeah, the Bill Potts one... Do you want to show? Can yeah, we? Go for Can it. we? Yeah, go for it. Go on then. Alphabetical okay. order. There, there we is. go. Check it out. Oh, very nice. It's by Rain, isn't it? That's I it. think so. Yeah. It's quite, yeah, It's you've got the shadow of the Cyberman. Um, it's quite eerie, isn't it? There we go, but that's all you're going to get to see. <laughs> and the cover. The beautiful and the cover. cover. Who, who did the cover? Uh, Lee Binding did the cover. Okay. Uh, and it went through various, uh, I gather it went through various yeah. iterations before everybody that needed to approve these things. Mm was happy and then on the back there's a selection of the uh, uh, characters in it so the que- question that Crystal and I get asked more than any other is why isn't Rose Tyler on the cover? or Martha or Sarah but, but Rose is on the back but so, she's on the back and I feel like back. I feel like the most commonly asked questions are where's Rose yeah where's Martha inside yeah. inside where's Sarah Jane inside, inside. <laughs> and also um is this is this just new who yeah is it classic who as well yes because like, all the people on the front are from new who aren't they yeah so that's i think that that's you know to, to try and attract the mm. the audience and, and they're not all companions they're also people who are in some of the people on the cover are people who are in just one episode yeah, so, yeah. which gives you a flavor of what it is but yes yeah. we yeah. we you know that wasn't our yeah. Oh, purview. I, 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 if, if it had been me, it would have just been <laughs> Tegan's auntie Vanessa on her own. On her <laughs> For me, it would have been Ace, 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 and Donna. Yeah. Anyway, um, I would like to point you out... like Ace, then, I love basically. Ace, I love Ace. Um, not biased at all, but I love Ace. Um, <laughs> I would like to point out, point out that um, authors don't have a lot of control over... You've, you're more experienced than I am, yeah. but, it, it, you know, in, in, in the world of books, but... Um, we don't have a lot of control over what goes on the cover but what I would like to say is you know they say don't judge a book by its cover do because a lot of thought has gone into what goes on the cover you know to Simon's point it is a selection to kind of attract you know young audiences mm. who, who will be more familiar with the new who also the, the, the hope no is idea. that you'll draw you know that yeah. people will be drawn to the Mm. sort of current stuff and then through the book they'll they'll learn and then be excited by lots of old yeah. stuff so it's a yeah. it's a you know a way in to to older doctor who for people who don't know it yeah so how did the collaboration come about did, did you guys did one of you approach the other one or did bbc books approach you guys or how, how did that all happen it was in the pub with you i think <laughs> Uh, after the paper doll signing. Oh, okay. Was that, I said I had heard about it then, but I didn't realise it actually came up. You actually yeah. came up with the idea in the same really, part. I don't really remember. I don't. Re- I can't pinpoint a time when we discussed it initially. But f- for me, it was the thirtieth Doctor was announced, and I had enjoyed working on papers do- paper dolls with Simon, and I really wanted to do some more writing, and then had this idea about doing a book about women and I approached you and was like does this have does this idea have legs yes yeah, so I my, don't know when that was so did my we... my uh, my memory is because we did the signing at Forbidden Planet for Paper yeah. Dolls and I think mm. that's the first time we'd seen each other in a while yeah and you kind of said I've got an idea for another book and what do I do maybe maybe you I said it on a, yeah, you ma- in advance in so advance but, but yeah. we talked about it there we, yeah so uh, I, I initially thought, um, Crystal was just asking my advice, do you think this is a good idea? Who do I mm. put it to? Or whatever. So I um, sent her a pitch for one of the previous books I'd done, you know, a successful pitch, and going, this is how you lay it out and whatever. Mm. But yes. Um, and then Crystal was like, no, no, I would like you to help write it. And yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, um, and how did that how did that work with two of you writing a book? Did, did how what's the collaborative process like? Do do some do you, did you divide the characters up yeah. or Yeah, pretty much. Once we decided once the list was was whit- whittled down to just over 70, 75 that appear in the book, um we just picked our favorites. I I bagged a lot of my favorite ones and Who got uh, 13? 
Are you allowed to say? I ended up writing. You ended up like... Well, so the thing that happened was that um, a I know older Doctor Who. I think mm. this is fair. I think Crystal will agree. Yeah. I know older Doctor Who in slightly more nuanced detail. Simon, yeah. To be fair. Um, and I, I also knew that we wouldn't have a lot of time to write it, so yeah. And I have a full-time job, and so but but you know there were there were characters that Crystal did know, so she knew Ace obviously, and she knew various other people. Don't so so we back, we we divided up the characters on that basis, and then as we were writing them, we were sending them back and forth to each other, and there was a bit of, you know, suggestions and rewriting and things, and then also our editor Steve Cole had suggestions about things, and he was polishing things and then suggesting ways that you could tie this entry with that entry and that sort of thing um so it was uh it was a bit of a mishmash really Mm -hmm. i don't Mm -hmm. feel any of them are really you know i don't feel there's any entry that's just me Mm -hmm. for example um the 13th doctor was uh uh tricky because we were writing it before we'd even seen her regeneration we didn't know i don't know about you but i didn't know anything at all Mm. so what were we going to do how were we going to cover her and how were we going to devote pages in the book rather than just a simple you know two page spread to her um so so that kind of evolved through various discussions about what we might do whether it might just be pictures of her um and what we came up with was to do a a a history of who she is because we've followed that that character since okay. 1963 mm-hmm. so um i originally wrote my original draft was a history of the doctor's character um but told but but changing the pronoun to she so mm. so there was once a woman who ran away from her home planet with her granddaughter susan that was mm. the, the kind of so i'm guessing so the bit in this instance the bit, chris chapman was renowned for being quite tight on who gets to know what did did they give you any information a little a little we had we had a um we saw a briefing document about the characters that, that i think it was about a page per yeah. character that was actually very useful for writing the um uh the entry yeah. on yasmin yeah. but whereas the whereas the doctor um well, I was also kind of conscious of, of wanting to wanting it to be specific. What worked very well on the on the other entries was not well, you know, she's a happy person or she's a whatever that might be, you know, she's a sad person or she gets cross. But to actually pinpoint it to specific things they've done that reveal their character or who they are, like mm. what job, you know. So, for example, the uh, Lady Jennifer Buckingham from the War Games being able to talk about exactly what bit of the army she's in because they tell you in the episode reveals something about the person that she is and the world that she's part of and things that's not net that that comes from the tv episode but it's not necessarily something you see on screen so we could that that kind of thing was the the, the delight in writing the entries so i was a little wary of writing the 13th doctor just based on what was in that document Mm -hmm. which was more about setting a tone of her character yeah. Mm. Um, and also it's it's a story of the Doctor you know the 13th Doctor isn't removed from all of the other incarnations mm. it's the same it's her, it's her life story it yeah. is her life story yeah. it is her story you and know, it's not a book where you've got to put the other 12 in so yeah exactly so, you don't, so you're not repeating yourself yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so that was the and, and, the, and, and effectively what she does is she ties together her story ties together yeah. all the other people in the yeah. book and stuff. so that was kind of the stuff that was going on and then um, when I wrote it I felt um, when I delivered that version, um, she did this and she did that. It felt quite exciting and radical and mm. stuff. Mm. Um, and somebody, I, I, maybe in Crystal, it maybe in Steve, the Steve Cole, the editor, or maybe some of BBC Books, said, um, "Yeah, but the excitement is that the Doctor is the excitement you're feeling is that the idea of the Doctor as a woman." that is the point of the book you know it's not mm. come as yeah. a revelation to anybody so um so we took the decision we tried a few things and we took the decision to take it out and and make it first person so it's i did this and i did that which is a bit of a gear change from everybody else but kind of works in the end of the book and yeah but that, that that's how these things we, so it's very mm. collaborative yeah we yeah. wanted to avoid using pronouns i think there was there was a lot of discussion about what we should do now now that now that the doctor has been both male and female um, and I think it just it just removes yourself from that debate yeah. if you just have it in first person. I think, and it's also like she's talking to you as well. Yeah, it's mm. like she's telling you the story, which is quite nice. Yeah, Simon, you've now I think 
written, if you, especially if we're including the 13th Doctor in this, every doc fiction for every Doctor apart from nine? Is that right? Have I got that right? Oh, uh... You're going to have to think back now, aren't you? But... Because I think there is one short... Isn't there a short trips where you've got the first eight in one story? You're right, yeah. So that covers them off. (laughs) Yeah, I... Oh, yeah, I think you're right. I haven't done The War Doctor. Oh, yes, of course. How could I I I I forget The War Doctor? I haven't done Peter Cushing, and he counts. Um, (laughs) uh, I'm I'm not getting involved there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Peter did. Peter Peter Cushing definitely counts. Uh, Yeah, but yes, I think so. Do you have a favourite? No. To write, to write, not not add your favourite doctor, but a favourite to write for. No, no. Part of the fun of it is that they're different. So, mm. I never get to choose which doctors I write for. So when um, you pitch, you don't pitch. Do you, do you, do you pitch? Do you pitch to the BBC books, or do BBC books come to you and? Or, they come to me. They're okay. and big finish. And big finish comes to you and, as and a they writer. S- generally, they say it's this doctor, it's this companion, because on big finish, it's these actors. Yeah. Um, and we want a story set in space, or we want a story set in history, or we want a we want a funny story about the Slovene, or whatever mm. that might be. And then my job is to kind of pitch back at them what my story would be that would fit those mm. things. So yes, so so mm. I don't get any choice. Um, and part of the fun of it is you get you get given that brief, and then you go, how do I make that work? What can I do that will bring out? What can I what can I put in the story that will bring out facets of that character mm. or explore things we have? Is there seen? one that's a bit more tricky to write that you find a bit more just because of the I don't I don't know, the way they are, the mannerisms or anything like that, that you find a bit harder to get down? I used to avoid, if I could, writing for the second doctor. He's very difficult. Or I found him very difficult because an awful lot of who he is and what he is is in the mannerisms mm. that he has rather than what he particularly says. Um, or I felt that and um, I then uh, there were a couple of things and I, and I had always felt that the, the books that featured him um, the, you know in the days mm. before Big Finish the books that featured him none of them had quite got him right and I was kind of aware that that was the thing that, that nobody had really or I felt that nobody had really got him to mm. a T although there's some great Second Doctor books um, and then there was a couple of things that came out there was a a short story that Nicholas Briggs wrote which I thought got him absolutely right and then I was editing a book of short trips that Eddie Robson wrote a second doctor story for and I just thought right there you know I can hear him I can whatever so I I was emboldened to give it a go having mm. seen them get it right and basically nicked what they did so you know I talked to Nick Briggs about it and he said you've got to describe what he's doing with his hands so, oh excellent, okay excellent. so you cracked it yeah oh that's good Crystal you became um, sort of known amongst Doctor Who fan and first of all for cosplay in a way in a way and, and your, so, yeah. your interviews and your own cosplay yes um, yeah are there any how many of the first of all how many of the women in this you fit that are featured in your new book have you cosplayed as um I've mostly cosplayed men, actually, from Doctor Who. Out of, out of out of the women, Ace and the Thirteenth Doctor. Okay, and that's it. Is there any there in any there things? that you are keen to give a go? I'm not sure. Oh my god! <laughs> that. Oh my god! I've been spending ages doing that. I don't know. Um, I'm not a particularly girly person, so I don't really wear you know dresses and things a lot of them are quite you know quite girly looking um i quite i like ace because it's the outfit is something i i would wear on a day-to-day basis like a bomber jacket Mm. um, and a t-shirt um that's a good question though it is a good question i mean i did make something for osgood i made a jumper for osgood once as uh, for a tutorial um for uh, the Doctor Who Festival. It was to help promote the Doctor Who Festival and cosplay. So I did that. Dress. Dress. Uh, Lady Chris- Christina doesn't wear a dress. Bill doesn't wear a dress. Maybe some of those. <laughs> okay. Yeah, same sure. same question to you, Simon. <laughs> if you could, have you ever done any cosplay? No. You, no. Are, are, uh, you, are you a fancy dress person generally? No, or not really. Not, not, not really. Um, see, I, I, I love fancy dress but I've never done cosplay so I, I might be tempted to give it a go but I don't know, know who would suit me I've got an amazing um, Tom Baker scarf that was knitted for me by a, a, a 
lovely lady, uh, Mary Moss, who, who uh, sadly has since died. But um, she, uh, I met her, at, uh, she's my brother-in-law's late mother-in-law, if that makes sense. Um, and uh, at their wedding, which was on the same day as the, uh, the broadcast of The God Complex, because uh, there was a break in their wedding reception to refit the reception for the disco and it was just the right amount of time for me to watch Doctor <laughs> Who which was very very well organised very um, convenient uh, but there, uh, uh, but she you know talked to me about Doctor Who there a bit and then at Christmas I had this package from her and it was an amazing wow. Doctor Who scarf oh my God. and um, and my wife you know and I was like well this is embarrassing because it's not you know I don't really wear that so it's not really my thing I, I do the stories and stuff. That's my cosplay. My cosplay's in my head, basically. Um, but I've always felt a bit awkward about dressing up or being too noticeable anyway. Um, so so my wife made me put it on so I could take a photo so that I could send it to Mary and say, thank you very much for this lovely thing. And it was really comfortable. It was so nice and plush wool and whatever. So I said, oh, it's a really nice thing to wear. So my wife put it on and she'd got a corset for Christmas a glam goth kind of thing so I took a photo of her in her goth corset with a Doctor Who scarf under the mistletoe blowing me a kiss and I put it up on Facebook or whatever which I was on at the time and that, like within I don't know hours, days Nick Briggs got in touch and said I like your scarf that looks really nice could, could we borrow it? and they were doing a photo shoot with Tom Baker to promote a Big Finish series so bizarrely Tom Baker has worn my Doctor Who scarf as Doctor Who in, wow. in some photos for the finish, um, which I was then able to send Mary, um, who was uh, quite ill at the time, and, and and just go, look what you've done. So Aww, she was delighted. That's, so that's, nice. um, that's a lovely story. Yeah, and I think I think any other cosplay <clears throat> after that would be would be you know. Yeah, uh, uh, that's really nice. How do you guys think that the depiction of women over the history, the long history of the show, has changed? Because it's been going for fifty more years, fifty plus years. How how was the depiction of of women generally in the show changed over that time? For for me as a fan, my observations are that things started to really change uh, when Ace came in, and um, she had more of an arc. She had um, uh, the Doctor suddenly took on a mysterious role. Um, you know, she developed across her time on the show um, from a adolescent to a, an adult um we see her on that journey um i think so i think modern companions are taking on more of a they have more of an arc we grow with them they you know we see them grow um they're a bit more relatable you see their backgrounds you see their families um you see their work um they've got stuff going on outside of their travels with the doctor um, so they seem a bit more fleshed out and a bit more three dimensional mm. in modern Who. Um, there's also things like, you know, Rona Munro has spoken about um, the lesbian subtext in survival, um, saying that you know in in those days it it had to be in the subtext it had to be hidden. Any any suggestions about that mm. was hidden. Whereas now you can be you can have very obvious. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, even way before Bill with Captain Jack, yeah. Russell br did it brilliantly. You know, ver very boldly brought Doctor Who back in two thousand and five, and went here. Here is somebody who, you know, who is from from the far future where those things don't really matter. Yeah, I don't. I don't disagree with any of that. I would. I would say that it wasn't just um, that you couldn't talk about. Uh, you know, that, that Ronan Monroe had to put in a lesbian subtext in survival. Um, Barry Letts, the producer in the early 70s, said um, that he had originally planned for Mikey Yates from Unit to be a love interest for Joe Grant, and that was overruled. They didn't think that was suitable for a tea time show. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a heterosexual relationship. So there, there are hints of it. Mm. Uh, the Curse of Peladon begins with Joe dressed up to go out on a date with Mike, and it doesn't happen. Um, but what you tend to get is a much more, um, rather than an exploration of a, of a of a developing relationship as an arc, what happens is that in the Green Death, Joe meets her future husband, and they get and he proposes, and they get married at the end of the story. Um, it's a very unsophisticated view 
of relationships, whatever the sexuality involved. Mm. Those kind of sensibilities, what was suitable for children's television, what was yeah. what was suitable for a family audience, are very different. Um, yeah. But also I think production teams over the years have had different interests in and different views about their treatment of women. So, so you know, Sarah Jane Smith, when she was introduced in The Time Warrior, um, says in that story and several others from her first year that she, you know, that she's... Uh, I think that the phrase they use is women's liberation rather than that she's a feminist, but that's that's very mm. trenchant. And then the following year, although her character doesn't become any softer in terms of her attitudes, um, that all is taken away. And the, the, the new production team that take over don't go at it that way. What they actually do, uh, and Liz Sladen talks about this a bit in her autobiography, is that they put her in less... Um, more girly clothes there's a bit where she says you know one of the questions is can't can't Liz dress as a girl at some point um and that's I think that's on uh, planet of evil that, that, that that's like one of the choices they make um do you think that we we the, the sort of changes that we've seen in in the depiction of women over the time is that led by changes in society or is it more yeah. the other way around do you think do you think the mm. pre- representation of the changes on TV leads society or does society lead I, I very much think that uh, television is a product of its time. Um, I do think that you know the, the attitudes of the production teams is because they have been socialised in a certain way. Um, I think you know you can pinpoint you know times where things have shifted and it's because society has moved on. And I think one of the reasons why now you can do a lot more with with the characters in Doctor Who is because it's a lot less taboo. You know, to do things like that on screen and to have diverse characters and, and LGBT characters. You know, we're not there yet. I think, you know, representation could be a lot better. Um, I think we could be, be... I think we could be a bit bolder. And uh, uh, I think, you know, we've, we have been... I just think television in general is still quite safe in that sense. And I think we do need, a bit, need to be a bit braver. Um, you know, I don't know. There's nothing to be scared about. You know, it's it, you know, it, it, this is it, it's reflecting the real world. Yeah. Um, it's not, it's not. You know, you're not, you've not got an agenda. You're not ticking boxes. It is just let's just be reflective of what, you know, the real world is like on our television screens. I think so. But yeah, I I, I very much think it's that. I, I don't know. But, yeah, I think I think the production team of various periods, some more than others, have tried to push things. Mm. And uh, Crystal referred to Russell and the and the uh, gay elements of that first season of Doctor Who in two thousand five, which were you know progressive for any television, let alone a mainstream kit mm. show aimed at a family audience. Um, uh, uh, but similarly with Bill Potts, similarly with um, similarly with Vastra, similarly with various bits and pieces in Doctor Who that you kind of go. This is attempting to push the conversation, the sort yeah. of cultural conversation mm. forward, um, and you know, I don't know. It was you know, Sarah Kingdom in the sixties was designed very much mm. in the in the um, mode of the of the Avengers girls. Um, you know, she's very powerful, uh, uh, strident, yeah. forceful, independent woman. Um, I also think you know people like um, Liz Shaw. And and being a scientist in the seventies, being a female, and how she's treated and how she's not taken seriously, I think that very much is. There's, a, there's an amazing, well. there's an amazing statement in the opening scene of Spearhead from Space, the first story that Liz Shaw is in, which begins with unit tracking an object in space, and a unit operative is at the control bank tracking the thing, and he go, you know, obviously there's something odd about it, so he calls in his senior officer who's a woman mm. a unit officer played by Tessa Shaw and that she's in one scene that single scene um, and that's a and it's it's this is set in the future and we will have female officers and yeah that's a real statement of intent mm-hmm. not only for the series but of where that Doctor Who stranded on earth set in the near future is going yeah, yeah. Um, and you can see bits of that in um, you know the, the, the invasion the unit story before that um, has a whole kind of thing about you know woman standing up to the sexist men in the army and whatever mm. it, it comes and goes and some stories are better than others some periods of the show are better than others um i think yeah. um you know there, there are various things that that the show has done over the year where you you know you can be quite proud of it and other things where you go yeah you could have done better 
get. Mm. Yeah, it's probably a bit of both, I think. I think, like, you know, looking back, you'll always see that, you know, there, there are things coming through on television that are very much of its time. But also, I just think television and media have a responsibility to push things and, and um, move things forward. And I think Doctor Who, has, you know, Simon's Point, has done that brilliantly so far. And it has done, I mean, look, female Doctor. You know, that's... We're doing it, so... Um, yeah, it's only taken... I mean, it was first, it's taken first mentioned in 1980. <laughs> it's taken a little while. It's taken a little while, but yeah. we're there. Yeah. We're there. Oh, yeah. um, I put a, a tweet out just to see if anybody had any questions for you from Twitter. Um, I, it's, I, not the police, I'm gonna, it? it's not the police, It's not the police, no. I've got a couple of else. Uh, so, uh, Jack asks, uh, how does it feel to have written the first book to be published featuring the 13th Doctor? Now, point of... It's, I don't think it is, because I've already ordered... Um, one Doctor, two hearts for my right. three-year-old ah. daughter, and that definitely has the thirteenth Doctor in it. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's not quite the first, but uh, but so it is it has the second. So runs. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, how does that feel? And how does uh, do you think the celebration of women will go down with the fans? Um, well, I'm going to skip ahead yeah. to your second question. Well, to Jack, was it Jack? Jack, yeah. Jack's second question um, about how it will go down. I was lucky enough to go to WarpCon at at the weekend and um, was invited to talk a bit about the book in a panel called The Women Who Lived, which was named after the book. And um, Sophie Aldred was on the panel, uh, Nicola Bryant and Katie Manning. And it was hosted by the Time Ladies, who are a brilliant, amazing uh, Doctor Who blog um, run by Beth and Kez. Um, and we talked about, we talked about women in Doctor Who, um, throughout history and we talked a bit about the book and um it was a full house so many people there and afterwards people stayed to queue and chat to me and i was giving some postcards out it was mostly for the postcards (laughs) but uh no they they um they queued up and uh had a had a little chat and all of them were so excited and so many people were saying you know i wasn't quite sure what this book was at first glance and now I've heard you speak about it I, I really want to I, I really want to buy this and lots of people just walking about day to day actually had this with me um I told people not to take pictures of the inside but I did let people look inside and um since then I've had so many tweets from people saying I saw this at the weekend and I, I've pre-ordered so yeah, that's, that's been that's work. been really lovely yeah 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 that's been really lovely so so hopefully that will be yep the same oh, excellent. going forward. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it all seems very positive. You were asking about writing for the 13th Doctor. Yeah, yeah, that is very exciting. I um, I was a bit slower off the mark with the last two incarnations, I think. So, uh, yeah, Capaldi, the first thing I wrote was a comic strip that he was in for Doctor Who Adventures about a year in. Uh, and Matt Smith, God, what did I write for him? I wrote a BBC audio book for him. And I pitched it. I was invited to pitch it before he was on screen, I think, or about the time he made his debut on screen. And then it was held back a year, so I had to rewrite my outline so it had Rory in it because the visual version was just him and Amy. Uh, So, yeah, that gives you an idea of how long it took. And David Tennant was... um, 2007, I was invited to write The Pirate Loop. It was the beginning of 2007, and it the came talking out. Talking badges. Yeah, the, yeah, the badger pirates. Yeah, yeah. Badger pirates. Love the badger pirates. Um, the Doctor Who Guide asks, what's your... Well, he's got a, a few questions. Uh, <laughs> what's your favourite part about writing a book like this? What character resonated with you the most? And how do you think this book will impact young fans mm. today? I think the most interesting ones for me were villains because you're basically writing them in like an inspiring way um because they are like you know they are largely positive the stories are supposed to highlight the the struggle that some of them you know encounter encounter in their lives and um the journeys that they go on things that they learn and um and that does include villains and i particularly liked doing cassandra because She's actually brilliant. Like, even though, even though she's evil, uh, to be evil, you have to have a lot of skills. You actually have to have a lot of qualities. Um, but she just uses uses them in the wrong way. That's the only thing. Um, just stuff like she's an opportunist. You know, she she uh, is very quick. Uh, spots an opportunity and she goes for it. And she's very cunning. And 
Um, uh, and you know, she's always thinking about. She's she's it's kind of insatiable like she's so passionate she's just driving it into the wrong thing uh, which is living forever um so i found that really interesting i think writing about villains in in a, in a different way missy or very similar um so that was my favorite part of the book to write yeah i th- i agree i'm um not necessarily on the villain's point but just on the fun of looking again at a Doctor Who story from the point of view of one of the characters in it and an unexpected one. So I think the one that the one where I felt, oh, this is something quite interesting mm. and different is the entry on her, the cave woman played by Alethea Charlton in uh, the oh. very first Doctor Who story. And just trying to get my head around what is she in it for? What are her relationships with her? Anyway? If this was her story, how would you tell it? Which is basically what we've done. Um, and you're oh this has opened up that story to me yeah. in ways I'd never really really you know I've, I must have seen that story yeah. countless times but but that really opened it up and and similarly on a bunch of others that 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 you just feel you've you've brought something you I felt I was getting something new out of it and mm. hopefully yeah. that will come over to the the reader um, yeah and it was just fun it was just fun working with Crystal it was fun working with Steve yeah. it was fun you know dreaming up stupid things for the artists to have to do. Yeah. Um, yeah and do, do you have a character that resonated that resonated most with you either of you um ace I'm, ace <laughs> i mean ace resonates with me anyway um i feel like she's the companion that's most like me um so that was definitely yeah pro- yeah hmm. probably the one that well, i resonate with the most. um yeah, I'm not sure I had a favourite. There were some that I really enjoyed. There were some that I felt I, you know, the the lady Jennifer Buckingham one. When I sent that in, because I'd actually had to do some real history research on who she worked for and how that, you know, the 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 the, the one reference she makes for which part of the army she's in turns out to be a really interesting bit of history. And um, so when I handed that in, I was quite proud yeah. of that. <laughs> Very nice. Um, and um, final question from me: Where are you going to be watching? on the 7th of October have you got parties planned I don't know I'm starting to think I should I should set something up normally what happens um, I've been at BBC Studios for three and a half years so this is my third series of Doctor Who working at BBC Studios and the past two seasons as part of my job I've had to be across what's happening in the episodes like I've had to look at look at scripts and, and oh, so you had to have seen it in advance I've had to yeah and I've had to watch uh, episodes in advance um, so I could come up with uh, talking points for mm-hmm. the discussion shows and the fa- uh, the after shows, um, and I've seen episodes in in various states of <laughs> like yeah. various states um, <laughs> without the CGI, without CGI fully done and... and things like that. This time round, um, I don't really know anything. It's, um, it's really it's exciting. exciting. I've not looked at any any scripts. Uh, I've not been able to get access it's really secretive even at work um which is a good thing i i think because it means that i'm completely unspoiled Ooh. so also <clears> it, <throat> and i probably won't see it in advance i don't think also it, don't it's think. um it changes your reactions to everything so mm-hmm. so i read uh, the first script i read in advance was christmas carol in 2010 and then i read everything while it was in production up to I think the Crimson Horror was the last one mm-hmm. so for about two years um, and also what that does is it fixes in your head what it is and what it's going to do but those scripts are changing and those the production yeah. might not you know the things might not be might not be filmed in the way that you imagine or they may actually not finish bits or, or you know all sorts of things are up in the air so then it means that when you actually see the episodes whether you see them in advance or whether you see them complete or, or partially complete or whether the first time you see them is when they're broadcast actually what your reaction is is, is this isn't how i thought it would yeah be. it's always you're always comparing what was in your mind's eye to what's on screen and yeah, it's yeah, really, yeah. It's really so, dis- so it, distracting yeah it takes you out of it, it takes you so, out of it yeah so when i yeah. you know when i left doctor adventures where basically you know my contract came to an end um and stop that stopped happening i started to enjoy doctor who a lot more yeah so i hadn't seen because they shot those two, 2012 episodes Uh, out of order Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen or read I think I hadn't read The Bells of St John at all I didn't know anything really in it I knew 
a couple of things because I knew that Richard E. Grant was going to be in it or, yeah. or whatever. But that was it. But I watched that episode at home, literally just going, yeah. I have no idea where this is going to go. And that yeah. was very exciting and fun. And, and the other thing is as well is um, the last couple of years, by the time it airs on TV, because I've seen it or read the script or something, I'm not really joining in with the fans. Yeah. yeah. It's not really, it's not a collective, it's, it's not a collective experience. Like, or even at going to a viewing party, it was just like everyone else. It's great seeing other people's reactions, but I'm not, in, in, in yeah, that, and know? I imagine if you know if you're at somewhere where there's other people and you know what's going to happen, you're just trying to not give away not, what, with facial yeah, expressions yeah, and yeah. stuff. What's coming? What's I coming? Think the last the last episode that I series that I saw where I didn't know anything was series eight and the Missy reveal. So I'm 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 really excited to get that experience again where I don't know anything and I'm 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 trying my best to remain spoiler free. Well, thank you guys for coming in again. Um, and if you guys want to win a copy of this gorgeous looking book. Uh, then all you have to what do you have to do Simon you have to like this video yeah. because it's great and you have to subscribe to the channel so Phil can tell you more things and you have to post in the comments what your favourite woman in Doctor Who is and why and then at the end of the month at the end of September just in case you're watching this later uh, September 2018 in case you're watching it in 2019 uh, we will pick a winner at random and BBC Books the very kind chaps that they are will send you out a copy so yeah, nice. thank you very nice. much, nice. and uh, bye. Bye. Hi, editing me popping in again with just a little bit of more information about this competition. If you do want to win this book, again, the the actual book, not, not the postcard, then uh, I'm afraid you do have to be within the UK or Europe. That's just for understandable postage reasons. BBC Books have asked me to uh, limit it to that. Uh, that's completely understandable. So uh, do pop your answers below, and... To, but to add a little extra to it, it should be a signed copy. So that's exciting. You get a signed copy of this book from both of the authors. Um, so pop your entries below and don't forget to like and subscribe uh, to enter as well. And, you know, even if you're outside of the area and can't enter the actual competition, I'd still like to know what what women from Doctor Who you, is your favourite. Let us know in the comments below, as usual, and um, yeah, see you soon.